<coughs> well, welcome in the precious and glorious name of Jesus to another episode of The Wake Up Call. My name is Robert Pears. We are living in truly interesting times, and we need to discern those times and know exactly what to do. I want to give fresh insight into the Gog Magog War and touch on the Psalm 83 War so that we understand what's truly happening right now in the Middle East. Because I believe we are seeing the stage being set for that war that will thrust the world into the tribulation period. And now is the time for the church to recognize it's all about a harvest of souls. And we need to be bold in the preaching of this gospel, bold in our prayer life like never before. So if you're ready, let's pray and let's press in to receive what the Lord has for us today. So, Father, we just come in that name that is above all names. We come to you and to your word. And I ask of you for eyes to see, ears to hear, and a hearing heart. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, you come to teach us and tell us the things that are to come. So open the word. And in all that with Jesus, would you receive all the honor and all the glory. And I thank you, Father God, that we would so arise and be the people that you desire us to be in this last and final hour in that name that is above all names, the name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Well, let's start looking at Psalm 83. Because, of course, many people say, well, isn't that happened first? And in Psalm 83, we see a confederacy of what we'll call near nations. That inner circle, nations that surround it, like Egypt, uh, Jordan, attacking. And in verse 4, we're told they come and say, Come, let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. So they come and attack and try to destroy and prevent Israel from being a nation. And I really believe that this happened in 1948 and 67. And it really changed the, uh, the, really the stage, what's going on, because Israel would gain back Jerusalem. It would become the United City, the United Capital, I should say, of Israel. They got back the Temple Mount, though, of course, they've given over the ownership or the, 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 the protection of that right now to Jordan. Now, in looking at Psalm 83, many people said that it will bring in this peace and it will cause Israel to get rid of its walls and set the stage for the upcoming Ezekiel 38 and 39 war. Many people say that this war has not happened, this Psalm 83, and I disagree. So let's go to Ezekiel 38 for a minute because there are certain issues we need to address. And of course, one of the famous ones is found where it says um, in verse 11, you will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. Please underline that. Um, if you read some of the older commentaries regarding this war, where you see how things were back at the time Ezekiel is giving the prophecy, that at that time, most nations, most cities, sorry, um, had walls of protection. In fact, I grew up in a town uh, in Northern Ireland, and it had a wall around it that was built, I believe, around the 15th, 16th century. So we can see that many cities had walls back in the time of Ezekiel. And it would have been strange if he all of a sudden was looking at a city in today. Uh, we don't have walls around our cities. Now, I want you to notice that he did not say a wall around the nation, but cities, villages. And that is true of Israel today. People point to the wall. But I wanted to show you here that just around that Middle East region, there are so many nations that have border walls, and that includes Egypt, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Iraq, Iran, Russia, Turkey, Afghanistan. So that area, it's very common, and in fact, the list goes on worldwide. We even here in America, to a certain degree, have a wall along our border. But we would still say that our villages don't have walls. So Ezekiel is referring to a time period where he's looking into the future 
and he sees Israel where the villages are no longer walled. And that would apply to today, the wall, because even if Israel pulls it down, which I do not see them ever removing that wall, there would be a wall that Egypt has, Jordan has, and other nations have. So that wall is not going away. Now, other people point to that they'll take all the land back. There's no indication of that. Well, they'll, they'll dwell safely. That word safely means with a security and also translates complacency. So they have a great sense of security, which Israel does. We know from the Valley of the Dry Bones that God would bring them back, restore them as a people, and make them a great army. And Israel is one of the most powerful armies in the world. That's the reason why we're not seeing as many attacks to invade Israel like we did in 1948 and 67. They've really become very powerful. I want to also point out something here in Psalm, or sorry, Ezekiel 35. And in verse 10 and 11, it says, and God is warning, because you've said these two nations and these two countries shall be mine, and we will possess them, though the Lord was there. So God begins to warn. There, there's a people. There will be a call for this two-state solution. But the problem is that the other nation does not want a two-state solution, but rather they want the whole land. And right now, particularly since October 7th, we've seen that rhetoric worldwide of what we want from the river to the sea. And it's very sad of what's going on. Now, going back to the Ezekiel 38-39 war. In verse 4 of Ezekiel 38, the Lord says, I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out. So, we see that in... 2022, I believe it was, that Russia began pulling her troops out of Syria. They were placed in Syria because uh, Syria is very strategic for Russia. They need a warm sea port. Um, they have, and they've been trying, one of the reasons why they're going after Ukraine is because they want Crimea to be a warm sea port. And they have one, of course, in Syria. Um, the other ones are all cold seas, and they have to go through either NATO nations or uh, right around the Pacific. So it's a long path. Uh, but the Ukraine war broke out and Russia began pulling her troops back. At the same time, one of the things that I want to talk about, if you go back to the 80s, and some of us remember those days in the Cold War, uh, the constant threats of, you know, a nuclear war, such like, it was a different world. And when communism fell, the world really changed. But something is happening in these recent years where there's been a return in that mindset. And then lately, Russia has been sending her troops back into Syria, not just into Syria, but they have been building their troops up along the Golan Heights in Syria, along the Israeli border. Now, this is very interesting because there's a series of things that Israel's been doing in Syria. Um, Iran, and let me now step back We've talked about that inner circle, the Psalm 83. Looking at what's going on right now, we are starting to see an outer circle war. Well, Hamas attacked, Hezbollah attacked, they're, they're inner circle. Yes, but they are under the control and leadership of Iran. They are proxies of Iran. And so Ezekiel is talking about the leadership because he does say many nations. He does not, and that's one of the arguments as well. There are no near nations. They've obviously been destroyed by Israel. It says that many nations, but what it indicates, what makes this war unique, is the leadership is not near nations, Egypt and Jordan. However, the leadership of the people attacking is Iran. And that's the key in Ezekiel 38 39. It is Iran is the leader, and Russia is brought in, put on hooks in her mouth. And the reason for that, have you ever had where you said something um, and then you became entrapped by your words? And Russia has made alliances with Iran because why they need certain technology, they need the drones and such like in their battle with Ukraine. But there comes a day we have to pay the piper back. And that is going to come very soon where Iran is going to say, we need you to help us. So Iran has been arming. It's interesting that a lot of Hamas had been in Iran training prior to October 7th. Many have Hezbollah being in Iran training. Iran, of course, sponsors that terrorism in the Houthis in Yemen, and we're seeing them rise up as well. 
Sadly, right now, what we are seeing is the real lack of leadership in America, where we are caving and bowing to this Iranian thugs instead of standing up and we could stop it. We're not, we're giving them money to further sponsor this terrorism. So it's very concerning what's going on in the Middle East and we need to follow the money to really understand what's going on. Now, looking at that, so Iran has all these proxies that she's really been pushing to attack because she doesn't want blood on her hands. However, they've been sending in arms and equipment into Syria where, again, they have proxies um, and trying to get those to Hezbollah and Hamas. Well, Israel has been responding by attacking those places, including the airports. Now, recently what happened is the Iranian embassy in Syria, which they felt very secure. Um, Israel attacked the building beside it and killed the leading guy who is in charge of all these terrorist attacks, including the terrorist attacks in Iraq against Americans. So this should have been an event that even America rejoiced at because this was a terrorist who has been killing Americans in Iraq. Even Iraq has really fallen and Iranian proxies now have a ring of fire. And that's one of the things that we're seeing right now. So while we're seeing what looks like near, near nations, they are under the influence, under the leadership of Iran. Iran is working very closely with Russia. At the same time, we're also seeing Turkey very much connected and involved. Now, many people say, well, surely the nation here, the northern nation, Gog Magog, is Turkey. And maybe you think that, no, whatever, um, I disagree. And I've done a video where I've shown all the way going back to Josephus, where he defined this Magog people as the Russians. Uh, looking at Ezekiel 38 and 39, we see that the consequence of this war is the destruction of Magog. But in the tribulation period, Turkey remains a very powerful leader and army uh, where Magog disappears. Right now, we have the two superpowers, which of course are Russia and America. But they somehow disappear, or at least are not in a major leadership role in the tribulation period. The whole thing shifts back to Europe and the Middle East. So something happens, and I believe it's this war. So we see that God will turn them around. We're seeing that happening both in their mannerism and, of course, in the return of their troops. We see there's a hook in their mouth, and so we can understand why they're going to come back in. If I go now back to Ezekiel 38, in verse 14, uh, it says, Therefore, son of my prophesy, say to God, Thus says the Lord, on that day, some day is going to happen where there is these voices that come to this leader. Messages, you know, such like from these other parties, demanding that Russia do something and respond accordingly. Verse 15, then you shall come from the place out of the far north. Come from your place out of the far north. Now, we can also point to uh, Isaiah, let me see if I got, Isaiah 43, where God talks to that nation, says, give up my people. And in the 90s, we saw the greatest return of Jews, and they came from Russia. And so there's a real strong influence of these Russian Jews uh, right now in Israel. So going back, I'll bring you from the far north. And it says, you and many people, all of them riding a horse, a great and mighty army, you will come up against my people in Israel like a cloud. You, talking to Gog Magog, you're going to come like a cloud. And I believe this initial attack will be an airstrike as well as a ground response of many nations. Now, the consequence is, of course, God sends a major earthquake. And we're seeing something going on right now with earthquakes. And I believe that God is trying to give us a warning that we are so close to His return. If I go to Luke 21, verse 26, Jesus said this, men's heart failing them from fear and the expectation of those things coming on the earth. And that word coming means something coming down onto the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. What is he talking about? Well, it wasn't COVID. It wasn't any of the financial crisis of you know, 28, uh, 20, sorry, 2008, 2020. It hasn't caused this. What is it? 
Well, as we look at this Ezekiel 38, 39 war, I want to show you a couple things. First is the response of the nations. Right now, of course, we see Israel is gaining a lot of attacks and persecution uh, because of the claims regarding the aid, regarding food and such like uh, materials getting to the people in Gaza. So, when I look at what the rebuke is, verse 13, Sheba Dam, the, uh, let me go back to verse 12. Yes, to take plunder, and so you've come to take plunder and to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that again have been inhabited and against the people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods and dwell in the midst of the And that's true. But I want you to see that they point out livestock and goods and then go on to explain, have you come because of the livestock and goods, what Israel has? And we can see, as I said, Israel is gaining a lot of persecution over the claims that they are starving the Gazan people, that what's going on in Gaza, even though they're producing evidence. No, that is not the case. There's a lot of food. That is the narrative, and that is the narrative that I see in this chapter. That they're going to speak out and say, well, that justified what they did because, well, Israel was bad. Now, and they don't stand with Israel. There is a consequence. Of course, God sends this mighty earthquake that has felt all around the world. So get ready. Uh, somehow, some way, it's going to really shake the earth. It's going to be an incredibly powerful earthquake that will cause such fear to come on the camp that they begin killing themselves. And then, in verse 5, You shall fall on the open field, for I have spoken, says the Lord your God. And I will send fire on Magog, on the nation, and those who live in security in the coastlands, those who live in complacency in the islands, is a better way of translate it. I will bring fire. So the response is not just locally, but there is a response in Russia, and in the islands, nations that dwell in complacency. Um, what are, what's this fire? Is this missiles? Is this nuclear weapons? What would cause men's hearts to fail them for fear for the things that are coming on the earth? And I really believe this may be, again, this is an opinion, this is not a thus save the Lord, that these may be weapons of mass destruction that truly do such damage to America, to Russia, and that is the reason why they are no longer a key player in the tribulation period. We see that the Russian army really is destroyed in this event. Uh, Russia truly is not able to recover, at least in the short term, for the tribulation period. Now, as I bring this thing to close, many people say, well, surely this Gog-Magog war um, is at the end of the millennium. That is a different Gog-Magog war, and I did a video to explain there's a lot of key differences in the cast of characters and in the timing and how it goes. This, Gog Magog War, they will disarm and burn those arms for seven years. So, why would they, if it occurred, say, year two or three in the tribulation period, why would they continue to burn in the millennium? Because the seven year period would end and there would be such an overlap where they'd be still burning these weapons doesn't quite make sense to me. So I believe that this event and that significance of the seven years is the tribulation period because that's when everything changes. And the battle of Armageddon is where the nations come to Jerusalem, to that valley by Jerusalem. And that is where they launch a war against Christ who then returns. Totally different war. Different cast of characters, different series of consequences. This war which is coming, I believe, changes the whole scenario. To give you an example, we saw that Jesus said regarding the kingdom that he would lease it to another nation that would bear fruit in its season. It starts with Germany. We can see Germany, for example, uh, under Martin Luther, the Reformation. It then went to Britain. Uh, after it went to Britain, Britain became the leading voice that impacted, of course, America. Now that, and I should step back, that Britain becoming that leading voice revolved around the destruction of the Armada because prior to that, Spain ruled the waves. And had that not occurred, most likely America would be completely Spanish and would be dominated by Catholicism. But what there was was a change 
when Britain defeated the Armada, there was a shift and Britain then would become that leader that took, um, I think it was a quarter of the earth, something like that they, they owned, up until the second, first and second war, where we saw the decline of Britain and the gospel then was, went over to America. And America's been the leading voice, you know, preaching the gospel, sharing it worldwide until recently. Now we are going into decline. And in the last days, of course, we know it goes back to Israel. So there's going to be a final shift. And what you see historically is there's some major event that causes that shift, a war or something. Um, I could even explain how the gospel started initially with the Jews, but would shift to the Gentiles, uh, started with the destruction of the temple in AD 70. And then, of course, the uprising, uh, I think, which is 135 AD, and that ended where the Jews felt betrayed by Christians because Christians could not stand by that man who claimed he was the Messiah. They believed Jesus was. And Christians became anathema. And from that point, there really was a separation and the church became predominantly Gentile. So we've seen shifts. And as we look at the tribulation period, we look at the book of Revelation, there is a shift where everything goes back to Israel. We see the two witnesses become the voices of authority and delegation. And of course, they will then delegate and send out the 144,000. So there's going to be a change. And the 10 toes, of course, the 10 kings, they're all related to Europe and the Middle East. So a change is coming. And I believe it is this Ezekiel 38 and 39 war that we are about maybe see uh, that's going to launch the world into the tribulation period. But we have to realize we're truly seeing the stage being set for that event. And we could wake up any day and see this happen or see some alarm go off warning us this war has begun. And church, this is the time for us to pray. This is the time because why we are told that the husband, the Lord our God, waits long for what? The harvest of souls. He is longing for a harvest of souls. And we, the church, are here with the purpose of preaching this gospel. We are here in the context of that you are the salt of the earth and you know salt of his lost his flavor cannot be reseasoned was persecution go back to the sermon on the mount in matthew chapter 5 and read it and so we are salt and light particularly in a difficult season which we're seeing right now and now more than ever we need to rise up by getting first on our knees and humbly praying and interceding for the people and then preach this gospel with a real sense of urgency, um, or realizing we are anointed and appointed for such a time as this. Amen. Well, I pray you're blessed, and I pray this message is ministered to you. If it has, in the name of Jesus, would you please like, share, subscribe, and give your comments? Because as you do, you really help us with the algorithms at YouTube and Google. And I so thank you that together we would impact. We need to stand together. And I really ask, would you consider being a prayer partner with us? You can do it unofficially. If you want to do it officially, you can sign up on our partner page at robertpairs.org. You will get our email newsletter. We do not ask for money. If God puts it on your heart to be a financial partner, thank you. We want to stand together and do something big for the Lord this year. Reach as many backsliders as possible and see believers fulfilling the high call of heaven, preaching this gospel and fulfilling their purpose so that Jesus may see the harvest that he so gloriously deserves. Amen. So, as I finish, I remind you as always that this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it because through and for him, in that name that's above all names, the name of Jesus we pray. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. Thank you.